Good afternoon, everybody from sunny Syracuse, New York. Uh, welcome to the Art at Home Lecture Series, uh, a collaboration between the Syracuse University Art Museum, the College of Visual and Performing Arts, and the Office of Alumni Engagement in New York City. My name is Andrew Saluti. I'm an assistant professor and the faculty, uh, uh, the program coordinator of museum studies here uh, at Syracuse University uh, in the School of Design. And uh, it's truly my pleasure to be with you this afternoon on behalf of the SU Art Museum and VPA. Uh, even though this is a virtual event, uh, as an official Syracuse University program, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of the Onondaga Nation, the fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous peoples whose ancestral land Syracuse University now stands. When I was the assistant director of SU Art, one of my favorite responsibilities was the annual MFA exhibition. And I ran that show for a little over a decade. In 2012, I had the pleasure of working with our guest speaker today. His work became the centerpiece of the exhibition that year, uh, where he was awarded the Ginsburg Prize for Best in Show. Professor Jave Yoshimoto, has since gone on to be an incredibly active artist. His resume includes well over 100 exhibitions and dozens of solo shows to his credit in New York, Chicago, Portland, Seattle, Tulsa, Fort Worth, Lincoln, Nebraska, and Omaha. Jay's research and practice has taken him all over the globe and his work has received a letter of recognition from the United Nations, as well as being awarded the Joan Mitchell Foundation's Painters and Sculptors Grant in 2015. Yoshimoto is currently an assistant professor of art teaching foundations level courses, as well as being a very active artist and an avid axe thrower. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to Jave Yoshimoto. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to uh, Andrea and both Emily. Uh, it's an honor, and to be honest, it's very exciting to be part of uh, SU again after being away for so long. It's funny because I feel like I was just there yesterday. I remember all the things I used to do and I remember every single brush strokes and walking to campus and fighting the snow like everybody else. So yeah, it's uh, an honor to be back. Uh, so I'm just going to start off with um, a slideshow of my presentation and please uh, ask me questions at the end. Um, so here we go. I'm going to share my screen and yeah, I'll show you what I got. All right. So um, as uh, Andrew has already mentioned, my name is Jay Yoshimoto. Uh, I have a Master's of Art Therapy from the School of Art Institute of Chicago, and I also have MFA from Syracuse University in 2012. Um, I did my undergrad in Santa Barbara, California, and, and, and got my degree in the BFA in 2004 in painting, and I did a lot of found objects um, uh, and basically restoring objects to make paintings on top of these found objects. So I was working with narrative early on uh, to try to talk about different uh, topics and I was observing around, uh, around me at the time. Um, I had a conversation with a friend of mine back in undergrad and over coffee he told me that um, this one line, art making is an egocentric act, which really threw me off and I asked him what that meant and he said it was uh, every kind of artwork is self-serving and this is where I had a really uh, hard time trying to digest that information. I'm like, wait, art making isn't selfish. Art making is more than that. So ever since that, uh, he told me that line, I've been on this um, search of figuring out what is the purpose of art making beyond self-serving act. Um, so after I graduated from undergrad, I went to Chicago to uh, study art therapy at the School of Art Institute of Chicago, as I mentioned. Um, but it was not an easy route uh, because uh, initially my mother passed away um, and I was having a hard time trying to decipher what to do with my feelings, my internal conflict. So one day I came upon this bacon <laughs> for breakfast and um, brought me a lot of joy. And I knew I had to bring this back to my studio to start painting bunch of bacon. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of these slides quickly, but the, the bacon series is basically me trying to find uh, joy within my practice to try to find uh, equilibrium so I can get myself to, to a place where I feel like I can uh, use art to be more healing, to be, uh, for me to be more in touch with my um, personal self again. Um, 
but when I was done with my degree, I was working in the community um, with uh, different uh, community members. Uh, this is in Evanston, uh, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago. I was working with uh, uh, people who are trying to learn the process of art making, how that could be a very safe and very uh, healing act, but also a space for them to be able to open up about their feelings and communicate that without words, but with the gesture, the act of art making, and also by witnessing other people's um, um, practice of art making. So that in itself was a very rewarding experience. Um, and obviously after I was done with the degree, uh, I wanted to do more with my art making. So I went back to Syracuse for uh, MFA. Um, and while I was there, um, something I discovered in my boxes of uh, moving stuff was my really old Godzilla toy I had since I was three years old, which is one on the right, this little hideous toy that seemed to always go with me wherever I go. So it was like kind of strangely annoying, but at the same time, also very fitting. And because as a, as a child, I used to watch Godzilla films on reruns on TV in Japan. And whenever Godzilla went, he gets attacked by the locals, be it the lo uh, local humans or other monsters. And I thought he was like, world. I thought he'd be like a great symbol for me to paint uh, my journey uh, in grad school mm -hmm. and possibly beyond to kind of talk about um, my experiences uh, being in the middle of nowhere or being in the middle of the country or in this case being the East Coast. But I didn't want to just have Godzilla be uh, the end all. I needed uh, other influences. I needed other uh, inspirations for me to start putting a series together. So I was looking at works like the Hokusai works, uh, the, the flat graphic color um, and which is, a, I guess you could say, is a predecessor to uh, current um, graphic um, artworks of Japan, be it anime or manga or whatever you want to call it, um, to some more contemporary artists like Banksy and even some uh, historical artists like uh, Francisco Goya, who observed what has happened uh, around him at the time that he lived in and to capture a moment of history. So these were the kind of artists I was looking at to try to kind of capture um, some of the stuff that I wanted to make. Um, so in grad school, I was making uh, paintings like this where I was trying to talk about my personal internal struggle or my interpersonal relationship issues. Um, but then Godzilla became less and less important and became smaller and smaller in my paintings. And then I realized that I was more observer of the world. And this is the 2010, um, the the Gulf War, uh, the Gulf oil spill uh, from BP oil company, um, and I remember just how uh, incredibly beautiful the oil in the water was, but also incredibly destructive and sad to just observe. Um, and then I started playing with the other. Um, medium. So I was playing with uh, Adobe Illustrator. This is about 10 feet high by 20 feet wide in illustration. Um, to kind of talk about, again, my personal uh, relationship with uh, certain things in my life. In this case, my love for shopping. <laughs> um, I definitely am a big, um, and I'm ashamed to say this, I'm a big Black Friday fan. Um, so uh, it's every shopping opportunity is like a party to me. So this is like kind of like my shame um, and admitting that I embrace the idea, the ideology of consumerism. Um, but what was interesting about digital illustration is that I question, I come to the question like, what is an original? So I turned that digital illustration into this black and white uh, illustration and then uh, experiment with laser cutting for the first time at, at SU actually. Um, so in this case, I spray painted a, uh, a piece of wood uh, black and then I did like a reverse engraving where I did um, an inverse engraving where I did the white uh, part as the ones that I want to engrave away, ex uh, just kind of leaving the blacks um, exposed. So in this way, I was kind of paying homage to the Japanese with, with block print aesthetics, and um, but also staying contemporary with the technology that's been present and available today. Um, but shortly after that, and the earthquake of Japan happened on March 11, 2011. I was in my uh, second year um, in the MFA program. Uh, and for me, it was quite shocking because a 9.0 magnitude earthquake hit the northeastern Japan, uh, triggering a huge tsunami that washed away the towns, and which inspired me to work on this, uh, my thesis project, uh, the uh, uh, nickname The Scroll, uh, the actual title is Baptism of Concrete Estuary. 
Um, this is the actual installation shot uh, in the uh, SU gallery, and uh, that's the desk that Andrew uh, helped me build uh, for my painting. Uh, it's gouache on paper, and it took me uh, quite a long time to make uh, and paint. So it just started out uh, from right to left, and I uh, basically put down pencils down and I, uh, paint, I painted each color a uh, little bit by little bit with tiny brushes um, in certain areas that I needed to make some accurate renderings. I would do a uh, grid um, illustrations to um, try to capture some of the details. But this is basically my studio setup where I had two doors and some saw horses and I just brought the painting with me in the back of my band to wherever I can go. Uh, here it was a Vermont Studio Center, um, but also uh, started to work um, uh, some of the work in SU, some of the work at uh, the Art Students League of New York. And about 328 days later, I was able to complete this project um, that is, again, 30 feet long by about four feet tall. Uh, here are the detail shots. Uh, the nine rings on the top right represent the magnitude of the earthquake. Uh, the whirlpool representing the, the, um, the place where all the boats and houses and cars were you know, getting washed to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, here you can see U.S.'s Abraham Lincoln, uh, who was first on site to drop off supplies. Um, the tsunami coming on land, uh, the mudslide being triggered on land as well, uh, houses collapsing, um, the explosion nuclear facility um, in the Fukushima and Daiichi facility, uh, roads collapsing, oh, I'm sorry. Um, as well as like the oil refinery. Here's the, where I thought was a key image where the mother and the child, um, this is, was really heartbreaking for me to see. And I just thought it was important to capture uh, the idea of loss um, because a lot of people lost something that day. Um, to this day, 300,000 people are still homeless. Uh, 20,000 people went missing that day. Um, and in this um, final uh, slide here with the scroll, uh, you, you see all the volunteers coming into town to try to uh, rebuild for the future. So after I was completed with this painting, I wanted it to be more than just a painting I want to exhibit. So I went to uh, the local Syracuse Blueprint Company, I believe is what it's called. And with their help, I was able to scan this uh, large painting in. It takes about three hours, 20 tries, and by finally we got, we got scanned in. And we were able to make these um, reproductions and I was cutting this in the printmaking. Thanks, Dusty. Um, and I was able to sell every one of these prints and then donate uh, every penny of this um, uh, proceeds to a nonprofit in Japan where it, uh, uh, it went to an arts class that was helping kids recover from the, the trauma of the, um, uh, the tsunami. At first, the kids were just drawing uh, black circles um, on their paper, but eventually uh, the smiles returned to their faces. They were uh, able to uh, work and draw with colors uh, after a while. So it's nice to be able to contribute to something greater uh, than myself or greater than my painting. So that was really touching for me. Uh, afterwards, I went to visit Ground Zero uh, where the, uh, the tsunami hit. This is basically uh, what you'll see, uh, as far as the eyes can see, um, just foundations of houses. There's nothing left. Everything just washed away. Um, people had to escape to this local uh, nearby elementary school and escape to the rooftop and watch their houses just get washed away into the ocean. And it's really heartbreaking for me to see. And there's just piles and piles of rusted uh, rubble uh, that was like about three uh, stories high. And there's just no place for these things to go. Right, so it was really heartbreaking, but yeah, it was uh, something for me to really witness. I was, um, I was at tears just uh, standing there on ground zero. Um, but anyway, that triggered my um, new series of painting at that point, which is the disaster series. Um, just observing different um, uh, disasters around the world, but initially started out with more of a compact version of my uh, scroll painting. Um, so it has the same elements, the nine rings, uh, the mother and daughter, the tsunami, and the Fukushima Daiichi plant, the exploding background, volunteers uh, uh, rebuilding the background. So again, making homage to uh, the aesthetics of Japanese with block prints because of my cultural heritage but also a more of a contemporary style of um, painting because I am, I also work heavily with graphic design so and very crisp and bright colors to kind of talk about uh, not just the content but also the emotions uh, behind the paintings themselves um, and then 
the subject kept uh, shifting uh, so here are the debris from Japan, where does it end up? Well, they end up on the other side of the ocean, in this case, Pacific Northwest, where you have a motorcycle that washed up in Portland, you have a boat that washed up now near Vancouver, um, and all these other debris that was starting to just um, show up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Seattle, Vancouver. Um, and the soccer ball in the bottom right you see in the picture uh, is actually interesting because it has the, uh, the owner, the kid's name and address on it. So the Vancouver cover who found the soccer ball was able to return the ball back to the original owner in Japan. So it was a nice full circle story. Um, so it was like a really, uh, um, I don't want to say fun. It was a very touching thing for me to paint. Um, and then I started making other topics around the world. And in this case, it was uh, 2013 uh, when the U.S. was considering um, attacking um, Syrian uh, 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 government who was uh, using uh, biological weapons against its citizens. Uh, so this is more like a war games kind of a, a commentary piece here. Um, and looking at other man-made disasters, in this case, uh, this is about the, um, the, the Faroe Islands where uh, there's an annual tradition where every year uh, the islanders would trap these pilot whales in the bay and then they get butchered on the beach uh, by hand. Uh, historically, um, these pilot whales were used by the islands, uh, the islanders, to for fuel for food. Uh, so now it's going to become more like a annual tradition, kind of like a, similar to Fourth of July is for us in the U.S. Um, and what was interesting about the process up until that point was that I was relying on other people's stories. I was relying on other people's uh, news uh, to um, make a composition which in a way I feel was not quite enough. So in 2015, when I received my, 25th, uh, my uh, Joe Mitchell grant, uh, I proposed that I would do my own research. I would I'd travel to different places around the world to uh, make a series of work based on what I discovered. So I went to do two different countries and I'll try to go through these uh, slides fast. Uh, first place I went to is Nepal where uh, I believe like a 7.0 magnitude earthquake hit the country, uh, causing a lot of rubble, people being buried uh, alive, and then they were um, stranded in the monsoon season. So it was a very difficult time for uh, millions of people there. Um, the buildings are not designed for earthquakes, so it was collapsing everywhere. Uh, this is the village of Lang Tang. This is the most uh, heartbreaking story I had heard. Uh, there was a village of about 300 people. This is before the earthquake, and this is after the earthquake. The village is survived by one man who just happened to be out on a walk to buy some groceries for his wife. He had about $7 worth of money in his pocket, and he had nowhere to return to after that. Um, so here are my own images. Uh, this is me visiting uh, Kathmandu and um, uh, other towns just observing what was happening. Here are people just picking up their own houses and brick by brick to try to rebuild uh, uh, their houses uh, with their neighbors, with their friends, with their family members. Um, and I met other locals to kind of see uh, what uh, was happening. Uh, the woman we just saw was, um, uh, it was someone that was working with uh, an American nonprofit who was visiting these uh, mountain villages that have no roads and no access with cars and motorcycles just on foot. Um, and you can see uh, how the houses are built here. And this, this is not earthquake proof whatsoever. Um, so the, um, the American volunteer architects and helped design um, this design where you can use the existing material there to create this uh, uh, design where it's all, it can, the building can actually sway with more earthquake resistant. So uh, we were visiting and checking out these uh, thing and they, they didn't just build it for them, they actually taught them how to build so they can be more self-sufficient in you know, creating buildings that are um, you know, uh, earthquake resistant. So that was pretty cool to um, uh, see and visit while I was in Nepal. And I also uh, wanted to research uh, about the Syrian refugee crisis at the time. Um, my, much like everybody else, I saw the picture of the boy on the beach side that, was, uh, that drowned. Um, and I was researching this and how uh, the conflict on, in the country uh, caused the mass um, people to just leave the country. Uh, this is a staff from 2015, so I apologize for the old st statistic. Back then, uh, 3.8 million people was displaced. Uh, and these are the routes that people are going through. And I'm only gonna focus on the, on the route uh, north through Turkey, through Lesbos Island in Greece, because that's uh, the uh, place that I went to visit. 
Um, so this arrow here um, between Turkey and Lesbos, that's about 11 miles long. It doesn't sound like much, but when you have a really unpredictable water situation, the Aegean Sea, um, and where you have dinghies in that old county, it may to host maybe 20 people max, is um, having 100 people, it's going to sink. A lot of um, boats have sunk um, over the years. And even if they're lucky enough to make it past um, uh, the waters and land on the uh, island, they're facing a very rocky situation. There's no real safe uh, landing spot. Sometimes you get stranded, sometimes you still get, uh, can get washed away because the water is just uh, that unpredictable. So a lot of um, uh, people would discard what they have and then just try to walk from where they land to the city of Mytilene, which you see in the bottom right in the red. Most people land on the northern side of the island. And from the top of the island to onto the red uh, Mit, uh, city of Mytilene, it's about 14 miles on foot. And it, we're talking about mountains here. And it's very hard to walk those paths. And when, even if they get there, they are, there's no shelter for anybody to go to. So people are just sleeping wherever they can on railroad tracks, on the side of the road, whatever tent they can find. And, and in hopes that they can get registered as a refugee to, onto a camp and eventually hop on a boat to get to Athens and to, get, uh, to be able to go into Europe as a, uh, to seek asylum. Um, so again, 2015 statistic, uh, it was um, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world at the time, 12 million people were uh, displaced, which is uh, more than Haitian earthquake, Hurricane Katrina, and Indian Ocean tsunami combined. These are my pictures. This is when I visited um, the village of, um, oh goodness, uh, I'm sorry, my mind's drawing a blank at the moment. I'll come back to that. But uh, this is a, a fisherman's town. It's a village of about 300 people. Um, and this is where I sat of some of the people on the um, refugees land. And I was on lookout duty. I was working with the Lighthouse Relief, which is a, a Swedish uh, nonprofit uh, organization. And I was, doing a lot of different things, be it uh, um, uh, night watch uh, to make, uh, make sure nobody's like on the boat in the middle of the night uh, to actually helping the, with the landing of the boats themselves. Uh, what I didn't realize at the time was that it's not just Syrian refugees, there are refugees from all over the world. Uh, there's a lot of refugees from Africa that I didn't know that were uh, seeking uh, refuge. I didn't know that there were uh, refugees from Iran, Iraq, and other places. So it's a, quite a huge mix of people that I did not expect. Um, I was also on kitchen duty. We're making a large pot of uh, soup here for the, um, and hot meal for to serve to the refugees. Um, this is now a landing uh, image. Uh, my wife is in the picture there. Uh, and we are just trying to get uh, some emergency blankets on the bodies. Um, this is the middle island where all the life jackets get discarded, um, like hundreds and thousands. And it's like really high um, mountain of uh, light on refugee jackets. Um, some nonprofits on the island decided to reuse some of these materials to um, and make um, souvenirs for, uh, uh, for tourists and volunteers. But what's interesting about that is, is it's also a training program for refugees to learn English, to learn Greek, uh, and also job skills um, in exchange for making these things. Uh, they're also given bus passes and they have some normalcy to life. Uh, under Greek law, they're not allowed to find a job. They're not allowed to go to school. So these are what they have to look forward to because they're not allowed to do anything else. So when I returned, um, I started making a series of paintings. Uh, here I have frames of Instagram uh, in the, um, back then and because I was criticizing myself of how I looked at the world through the lens of uh, social media, through the lens of uh, news media, through the lens of computer, that my viewpoint is limited. Um, and I was also trying to find a way to make pieces that honor the lost lives in the Asian Sea, um, but also paying homage to uh, local Greek mythology and uh, local Greek art, um, in this case, um, the pediment of the Greek architecture, uh, the orange uh, you see here is the actual life jacket one of the refugees wore that, uh, that I brought back and used as a material. Um, also, uh, using the local stories to create um, the uh, composition where they have uh, this mythology of uh, the virgin mermaid who helps sailors cross the sea to safety. She has a trident in hand. She, helps, uh, she holds the boat in the other hand. So I reimagine the version as a refugee woman uh, carrying other refugees in the dinghy and um, having them uh, cross safely to, uh, uh, to safety onto the island. 
Um, and this is, um, uh, again, another piece that's on a similar idea. In the background, you see the conflict um, uh, that was caused by some of the uh, Syrian conflict, but also Russian planes bombing in the background, uh, the discussion that's happening between Vladimir uh, Putin and uh, Assad. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, making reference to uh, uh, iconography. Uh, there's a lot of icons in uh, the local art, uh, so the Byzantine art. So you have the mother and the child uh, making reference to the Virgin and, uh, and Jesus. Um, uh, local Greek mythology with the, the goddess Eos on the right, uh, helping them uh, uh, come across the land um, and some of the local architecture and just paying homage again to art history, but also in a more contemporary context. But shortly after this, I actually injured my arm. I could not pick up a paintbrush anymore. So I had to change my style of working. And this is where my old uh, experiment laser cutting came in. I had a lot of access to a local makerspace where I was able to use um, a laser machine um, and basically use a digital drawing as a base to create uh, different layers and different pieces and turn my paintings and my old uh, paint, uh, printmaking stuff into more of a layered relief uh, sculpture. Uh, much more like a physicality of a physical space. Um, and after I got used to the process, I was able to visit different campuses around the country, in this case, UNLV, to create some uh, the pieces into more larger pieces. So, um, but I also visit, uh, again, other campuses um, and basically turning my paintings into illustrations and working with some of the students to say, hey, this is my process, this is how I do it. Do you guys want to try to learn how to do this? So um, in a collaboration, uh, uh, the students over there designed this frame uh, for this piece for me. And we were able to uh, build the um, pieces together, which I thought was like a really nice collaborative effort uh, to create uh, more like a re uh, this um, joined uh, relief project. Um, but yeah, it, at first it came out as in just a reproduction of my existing paintings, um, my screen prints. Uh, but eventually I would uh, come and build my own um, design uh, without having to reference uh, my previous works. And this is one of those uh, newer original pieces where I was using my experience and my own photographs to make a collage of um, one of the refugees cooking a dinner, uh, the local Orthodox um, priest uh, playing music for us uh, while hanging out with the cat and the volunteers in the background just being tired from all the work that we had to do uh, in the tent. Um, making pieces about the local stories like one of the refugees told me that he had to pay 50 euros for um, and basically a lifesaver um, which is about 55 bucks um, for basically a donut right. Uh, and 100 euros, $110 to buy a life jacket, which could be counterfeit and, not even, and you may not even float in this life jacket. Um, and a thousand euros for a ticket on the dinghy to cross the water. So you're paying a lot of money to risk your life to cross uh, the water. So if you can understand the desperation and where they're coming from to pay so much outlandish money to human traffickers, uh, you know that they're coming and trying to leave a raid in a terrible situation. Um, so, the laser cutting um, pieces. Uh, I'm still composing it like uh, I am with my paintings, so just basically a collage of different ideas to try to talk about interactivity, uh, technology, um, uh, the gaze of us, um, uh, the outside world, into their personal lives and how we can get involved with their life. Um, this is a piece about Nepal, the earthquake. Uh, the village of Langtang is up, is up top. The earthquake is happening in the center of the piece. And at the bottom is the Indian border where they close up the borders and they could not get the supplies in, be it uh, water or fuel. Uh, so it's a, quite a bit of a political mess, even as the people needed help. It kind of sounds familiar to what's happening today, right? Um, and then I started traveling around the country in my car and I was just looking at different things that I would see. Uh, in this case, I drove by Powell, Wyoming, where uh, it was uh, uh, the site of a former Japanese internment camp. So I made a piece about that. And, uh, and I made a piece about uh, racism that used to exist in this country and um, that refers to these uh, uh, Japanese Americans being um, uh, deserving to be in internment camp and whatnot. And I also met a uh, couple in uh, Colorado whose uh, aunt was in the internment camp. So here's a picture of her enjoying a slice of bottom in, a, in the internment camp that she was at. And you could see in the background that the uh, people are trying to have some kind of enormity playing basketball while a soldier watches guard. 
Um, so yeah, just a lot of historical references um, about where we are in the country, where we were and where we are, I suppose. Uh, this is a story from, I think, a year or two, uh, two years ago, where three years was at trial for being an illegal citizen uh, crossing the border. But you could understand the ridiculousness of how a three year should not have to stand trial, right? She didn't speak English. And it was just the, one of the most weirdest things that's been happening in this country. Um, Here's a piece about a refugee that finally came made it across to Europe uh, to find some kind of uh, a new future for, their, for his life. Um, here is a piece about um, people who are stuck in the war zones, uh, living in destruction, but trying to find normalcy in that life. Um, and then I started working more colors back in because I could paint again. So this is more of a mixed media piece where uh, I went to New Orleans. Uh, I was at the Joe Mitchell Center for a residency last summer, and I read about how the, this lead content in the dirt and how it's affecting children. So I had this broken banjo with the local uh, lead contaminated soil inside the banjo with the child engraving on the uh, face of the banjo, um, basically lying, uh, uh, kind of talking about the toxicity of how this beautiful backdrop but yet it's actually quite um, dangerous to be in. Um, this is a piece about Tulsa and the uh, the opioid crisis that's been happening in Oklahoma and pretty much around the country um, about how addiction can really affect the loved ones and how that uh, pe makes people neglect the things that are important to them. Um, this is the piece again about the whole uh, the conflict and how people live in the uh, war zone areas, uh, but in more of a camera format. Um, in Nebraska, we two winters ago we had a, uh, that huge uh, uh, freeze uh, that came the polar vortex that affected our state, and came spring it all melted and triggered this huge um, flooding all around the state. We lost about sixty to seventy percent of our crops and cattle. Um, and it was just devastating. So this is just uh, me talking about the, the structure that happened within the state of Nebraska, um, the state I'm currently living in. Um, and again, observation about what's happening. Uh, in this case, I'm uh, making a commentary about the border uh, crisis where um, even children are treated like uh, an illegal immigrant. Well, they are an illegal immigrant, but they are treated very badly so uh, you can see the stars in this uh, flag here are replaced with the uh, camps, that's, um, uh, which is uh, very standard and um, quite a few around Texas area. Um, this is a piece, I, again, I made about the refugee crisis. In this case, I made it through a phone. Um, and I used the life jacket uh, leftovers again here to kind of represent almost like a blood flowing down the bottom of the phone. Uh, I used the phone because it is something that we uh, peer through uh, the world at, but also at the same time, it is, it is a tool, a tool that we can choose to answer or ignore this call for help. Um, and I just want to show you through, uh, these are the last few slides. Um, my, my most recent projects I'm working on uh, since the quarantine started. So I um, also kind of to talk about how my design process works too. So I would uh, create images or uh, find source images to take, uh, make images out of and basically set the stage. I had uh, the, uh, the main characters and I had the backdrop and I had props uh, to kind of set um, the tone and the space and the, and the, and, and the storyline. And then basically ended with a frame. Uh, so this is the piece I cut this week. Uh, it's this, this is not glued yet. This is not painted yet. It's just pieces just stacked on top of each other at the moment. Uh, but to talk in this piece, this piece just really talks about uh, how we're isolated. But at the, at the same time, the isolation is also dangerous because it is also a place of um, potential domestic violence. Um, and then there's also a piece I made about. Um, initially how hard it was for us to go grocery shopping, especially for the elderly, uh, where we can't find any toilet paper. Uh, and uh, some materials are just scarce, um, yet we yes. are enjoying Tiger King on Netflix, on, you know, as you can see on top left. So a lot of references about uh, what we observe, how I observe things, um, and uh, how I turn them into more like a sculptural piece uh, with my process and also how hard the healthcare workers are working in a very um, much of a virus environment where it's just kind of spreading all around us uh, and like in the vine that you see on the walls here. So 
yeah, that's basically all my works uh, and my current uh, status. Um, and I just want to end, the, end my talk with, uh, so what does it mean to be a practicing artist? And this is just an advice for any young artist, uh, be undergrad, um, grad students or whatever. Um, and this might be kind of obvious, but you know, please bear with me here. Um, so first thing, create digital archive of all the works, uh, have an artist statement, resume and CV, biography and statement, uh, obviously very important. Um, have an elevated speech ready to explain the works, Learn to write about uh, works that are constantly evolving because your work is always changing, right? Um, create and maintain a website, a social media page. Again, obviously, I mean, you should be doing this already. Uh, support fellow artists and promote them. It comes back full circle. It's, it's very much uh, a social circle, right? So don't be a jerk. Um, establish work regionally <laughs> and nationally through artist calls. Uh, save receipts for all art related expenses for tax purposes. You can write off a lot of things, so don't get rid of those receipts. Uh, have an art hero, both dead and alive, to look up to. Um, learn to properly pack and protect your works because don't trust UPS to take care of your stuff. Um, I've had stuff broken before. Um, again, don't be a jerk. <laughs> nobody likes, um, you know, I, I'm not gonna, I'm leaving out the exp expletives, but nobody likes a jerk. Um, have an attitude of gratitude. Uh, if you're grateful for an opportunity, then uh, it's just gonna be a little bit more sweeter uh, anytime you get an opportunity. Choose a topic of passion and follow through. Uh, practice mindfulness and self-awareness. Uh, the more you're aware of yourself, how you're feeling, how you're uh, responding to things, the more it just feeds your creative process. Uh, so my conclusion, um, based on that conversation I had earlier uh, with my friend about that uh, egocentric act, is that art making is an egocentric act, as it is difficult, if not impossible, to create something that does not involve the self, because you can't never remove yourself. However, it can be a catalyst for serving the larger picture and the greater good, a tool for introspection, self-awareness, and connection with other people. Art making is an opportunity to start a dialogue and conversation on things that are poignant in contemporary times and today's world. So that's my talk. Um, anybody have any questions? Uh, there, are, there are a few uh, questions that are pop. Can you hear me, Jeff? Yes. There are a few questions that are popping up in the uh, in the chat, um, but I have a, I just have a couple uh, uh, that I'd like to ask first. If that's okay. Sure. And uh, that that uh, sentiment that you're ending with in terms of the um, you know be, not being able to separate yourself from your work that's a great place to start because I want to talk about Godzilla, um, <laughs> Godzilla and legacy, right? So so yesterday we had a nice chat and uh, we were talking about artists that came before. Uh, like fellow SU alum Roger Shimomura and uh, contemporary artists like Enrique Shigoya, uh, mm -hmm. taking appropriating cultural and pop cultural imagery to create uh, uh, statements about that outsider's view of, Amer of American experience. And uh, but what you're doing is what you're doing is slightly different. You're you're, you're appropriating that style is that ukiyo-e style as well as the Godzilla figure as a surrogate for yourself, but as it evolved throughout your work, it's, it's almost as if Godzilla is no longer the threat. Godzilla is just kind of watching, you know, he's, he's the creature watching or the outsider watching, uh, watching the disaster that's happening in, in front of him. Um, how, ha, is Godzilla gone from your work now? Is he going to come back? Is it something that you have kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 settled on and, and, and are ready to move on? Or, or where, where, is, where, is, where is the Godzilla surrogate now with your work? Well, Godzilla's still in there. It's just more, much more subtle. <laughs> the, <laughs> not as important a forefront anymore. Um, so in the, uh, the nurse or the medical workers piece I showed, the Godzilla's actually hiding within the vines. So it's really subtle and very hard to see. I mean, it's not that important for me to show it. Um, but yeah, I'm partially um, stubborn about it because I don't want it to leave from my series um, right. because of a conversation I had with one of the faculty back at SU. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's funny because after I made my fifth Godzilla penny, he said, well, you kind of beat it to the ground already, didn't you? I mean, there's no point in bringing any more Godzilla. What more can you do with it? So I haven't stopped using Godzilla since, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but um, yeah, it became just a symbol for me. Uh, it's basically one of my signatures um, that I incorporate. I have, three I have three basic signatures. One is my name stamp. One is um, Godzilla. The other is the sequence of numbers, which is uh, latitude, longitude, and date and time. I was born in my favorite number. All three wow. are always in my pieces. So just have to find them. 
Well, and to follow up there, I mean, I, what, what I think is very smart with, with uh, uh, Godzilla is the fact that you're using it as, as the outsider, as something that is generally feared as soon as you see it, which is a great analogy for, you know, the immigrant experience. And I don't know how much that plays into your work and the concept of that you, you do have, you know, you, you have a very American, you, you have a view of America that many don't have, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and to me, using Godzilla for that kind of analogy just seems like, it, it seems like you could, you could never put him away. I mean, it, it's something that, that, uh, that will always resonate, right? Yeah, um, Godzilla's like this thing that sticks out like a sore thumb. You can't not see him, right? It's, it's kind of like where I am in the middle of uh, nowhere America where I'm always noticed, like, oh, who's that guy kind of thing. And whether they mean to or not, sometimes I am a victim of a stereotype or uh, racism. Well, sometimes it's an accidental racism. Uh, people are nice about it, but then like, you know, that's kind of racist to say, right? Uh, so stuff like, hey, uh, you, you remind me of the guy from uh, the, cooking, the Asian cooking show. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, so yeah, stuff like that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not something that would like you know scar me for the rest of my life but at the same time like these things happen so godzilla became this like you said a surrogate for my experience in, in america um i just stick out and uh whether i like it or not i get attacked in ways that people mean to or not but then to me again what's most what's most interesting about about the evolution and i'm mm -hmm. so glad you ignored and i and i probably know which faculty member it was but i'm so glad you ignored that that that, that advice because the evolution of godzilla that he's just started gradually moving further back into the background even though he's Godzilla to me it's it's a very it's a very strong concept yeah. um, so the other question that I always like to ask and, and people who know me on the you know watching this uh, are inevitably going to ask when I'm going to talk about process because I love process and I love technique and we've had mm -hmm. a lot of conversations about printmaking um, the evolution uh, 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 that you've had from painting to sculpture to these laser cuts uh, which, you know, as you said, was at first forced, but now it's become kind of a, uh, it's become one of the main vehicles that you use. How do you feel that those objects, which are, you know, still two-dimensional, but three-dimensional at the same time, how do they work differently? How do they speak differently? How do they engage the viewer differently from the, you know, the gouache on paper? Yeah, with the paintings, they're much more fragile, they're much more I guess precious because you know, I had to put them in the frame or whatever. And with the laser cuts, yeah, they're fragile too, but seeing that there's this physicality that just never existed in my work before. And that's something kind of like really nice to have. Um, it's kind of a sculptural object, but yeah, it's more, kind of like a two and a half D uh, relief print, right? So, <laughs> two and a half um, D, I'm like. <laughs> yeah, and um, it's, 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 it's something I can still work with because it's in a compositional format that I can understand. I mean, I envy any sculptors because I, I I have a hard time thinking in 3D uh, most of the time, and I also envy printmakers because they can think in layers that I have a hard time doing sometimes. <laughs> so I guess uh, it's me trying to kind of uh, you know uh, pay honor to those guys who, who got those amazing processes, but at the same time trying to, in something new and evolving as I have to. Um, and you know, when during this COVID times, I had no access to laser cutters, so that made it really hard for me to make anything so i was sitting on these drawings for months and like well when do i get to make these things the answer was this week which is great but i may lose those uh, opportunities again who knows um so with that in mind i may have to transition to different type of um, process again see if i can my uh, uh process can evolve to something else um so yeah see but that's the thought process that i the, that that really gets me excited about seeing uh, uh, seeing the artist at work is that, I mean, you don't, even though you, you're doing these drawings digitally and you already have this, you know, what in essence, a matrix, you know, set for the work, uh, in, in your mind, that's not the finished product, right? That is, that right. is a delivery method. That is part of the process to get to this other thing. And mm -hmm. right now, that other thing, especially, you know, in concert with, now you've, you've joined, uh, uh, the, the found objects, the banjos, with the laser cutting, with the painting, like with all of these things coming together now, um, uh, it's, it's kind of exciting to see, to see the work, to see where, where, where it's headed. Yeah, thanks. And, and, I, and I hope that you do have access to a laser cutter. I hope we all have the access that we <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, 
I well, I have I have more questions, but I know that there are questions popping up in the chat. Um, Emily, do we want to start to look at some of those? Uh, sure. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so we do have a, a one question about your work being um, very powerful and moving, um, and addresses a lot of very important yet difficult content. Um, yep. How do you take care of yourself emotionally when you make your art? That's a well, great question. I, um, that's the thing. When I'm making work on a heavy topic, I'm completely invested. So if I need to take care of myself, I have to do it outside of work. Um, so these days, it might be just throwing access <laughs> at the hardwood targets um, or just uh, uh, doing something that's completely opposite of what, uh, of what my brain is doing at the time. So maybe I'll uh, binge watch Netflix or play video games or something to just get my mind off the topic. Because it is, it does have a toll uh, on me after a while. Like when I painted the scroll, it was probably one of the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with. I could not make art for three months. Uh, so just really depends on the topic I'm trying to work on. I tried to start a piece about the, uh, in the George Floyd um, Black Lives Matter movement, but I couldn't finish. I got started, but I just couldn't go on because it's just such a really heartbreaking, heavy topic. So sometimes I fail um, and that's okay. Um, I just have to do what I can, I guess. Do you, you know, that's, uh, that's, that is such a great question for what's happening right now, especially right now, you know, beyond the pandemic, um, there is, there's a, there is a lot of crisis. I mean, there, there is, there's a lot to tap into, you know, for, for somebody whose work is really kind of a social conscious in what's a very news bite quick, you know, uh, quickly digestible and then forgotten uh, yeah. uh, cycle. Um, and then how you navigate that, how you, how you decide to place focus when there is no focus. Uh, that's going to be that's going to be very challenging. Do you so in the in the case of Black Lives Matter, is that something that you're just putting aside and hoping to revisit? Is that something where you just need to say no, that's not going to going to work? Or well, here's the hard part. I mean, it's uh, it's hard to uh, touch because of the fact that it's a very specific movement uh, that affects a very specific group of people. Right? Uh, I'm a person of color, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not black uh, and for me to make that, make a piece about that, uh, I wonder if it's my place. So that's one of the reluctance as to why. If a white person made a piece about Black Lives Matter, I, I think it's got to be a huge pushback, right? Uh, so I am trying to be sensitive of how in the delivery of the content as well, because not every uh, piece, I mean, I have my thoughts and my feelings about it, and I'm sure it has its own value, but at the same time, maybe it's not as important as uh, uh, once that's coming from uh, the actual group of people that's affected, if that makes sense. So, you know, to say, you know, another, like maybe um, a different group of people made other stuff about the Japanese American term um, art. I mean, is that, a genu is that as genuine? I don't know, maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure. Uh, is it genuine from, for me to make that? I don't know, I'm, I've never lived that time, uh, right? right? So these are things, questions I have to ask too before I make something. Just because I started something doesn't mean it is my place to continue making it. So it's a, it's a tough place. I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's basically, I mean, that's exactly the sentiment of, of my question is that it's, you know, how do you focus? How, how, how do you decide right now? And um, right. anyway, I have no answer. Yeah. Um, so, you know, considering how many, Considering how many alums we have uh, on this call, and this is uh, this is an alumni engagement event. I, I myself, uh, an alumni as well. Emily is. Um, I, I'm curious about your time here in Syracuse and what that, you know, for coming from just from the the West Coast to the East Coast, did did that have a uh, discernible impact on uh, your your approach and the way that you saw, you know, how your work was? Yeah, I think uh, culture of Syracuse itself was uh, something I had to get used to. I came from Chicago at the time. I was more used to diversity and then there was a much more, uh, not say, I, I'm trying to say it wasn't open. It was a little bit more closed minded than I was, it was in Chicago. Uh, but also uh, everything was much more close quarters for me in Syracuse, right? So, you know, I was in within two miles on campus. I, my commute wasn't very much except you know, to and from the campus. I was making art all the time. So I wasn't getting out. I wasn't getting involved in the community as much. Uh, so that was a difficult thing to navigate as well as like the huge piles of snow. Um, <laughs> it's also different from Chicago. Uh, they have snow, but not the, the Syracuse kind of snow, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, the draw was that, you know, we had access to New York City. Um, 
but that being far away from such a nice city and it was kind of feeling isolated in Syracuse was a different, very different experience. It's not to say that it was bad. Uh, I definitely enjoyed my time there. There's definitely ups and downs to every experience we had, right? But um, I think the people I met, the opportunity that I had and the opportunity to make the scroll and Syracuse was fantastic. Um, I could never take that back. Um, and I would do it again if I had the opportunity. So if anything, I think, um, yes, it's a cultural shift I had to get used to, but then that's true for any grad student going into I mean, SU. Um, but, you know, we had to make the best of what we had while we were there. And I think I did. I think you did too. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Emily, more chat? Uh, yeah, we have a couple more questions. Um, okay. Maybe following up on this, I, it's kind of related to your time at Syracuse and being an mm -hmm. alumni. Um, what was your favorite thing about being a student at Syracuse University? What did you enjoy the most, I guess, or a place uh, maybe even? <laughs> well, I mean, I think uh, the camaraderie between some of my colleagues and I, uh, the fellow grad students, and even some of the undergrads, um, that I was able to have some really nice, genuine conversations. Um, I mean, the SU sports was also something that I, Certainly love and enjoy. I definitely had took every opportunity to attend basketball games or football games or whatever, but it's just the idea of community, I think, and that really you know, helped me through my uh, uh, mind there. Um, some of the faculty has been very supportive uh, and uh, also challenging, which I needed. Uh, so I think that was a necessary part of my growth. Um, so yeah, just uh, being there, being around people and learning to grow uh, was uh, my biggest thing for me. Um, I think we have time maybe for one more question. Andrew, unless you have one that you still nope, want to ask. Um, we have a, a question about art heroes, how you mentioned that you have an art hero. Who are yours? Who are the artists that you look up to or who inspire you? Um, one of the artists I look up to currently uh, that's alive, Banksy is one of them. But another one is um, this artist named John Sabra, who is a painting professor from University of Ohio. And he does very socially conscious work. Uh, what's interesting about his work is that he found a problem in his community, which is uh, the toxic water coming out from uh, drainage mines or whatever, and turned it into clean water by taking the acid out of the water and turning that into painting pigments. So he was able to work with, uh, I think, Windsor Newton, and they are actually releasing a series of his uh, paint tubes uh, that's straight from the mines of uh, this uh, acid drainage sites. It was really amazing. Uh, so to really be creative about thinking about how we as artists can contribute in ways more than just creating, you know, pretty compositions. So that's something that I really uh, can appreciate about what he does. That's great. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I guess uh, we're at about an hour and okay. uh, I want to, uh, Jay, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for yeah. showing us your work. It's great to see the evolution over the past uh, decade uh, of, uh, of work. And uh, I want to thank SU Art for letting me uh, chime in here. And um, I hope everybody stays safe, stays healthy, and good luck with fall 2020. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. thank, you thank you, Jay, and thank you, Andrew, for, for hosting and moderating. Yeah, thank you, guys. It was great. great. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye.